All right, Aaron. So thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, we spoke a little while ago, and then we finally got to do this today. Um, we were thanks talking for about having playing. me. Oh, I appreciate coming. Um, it's not like I had to travel to the studio, which is nice, right? Yeah, all 10 miles over there. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about, I want to talk about all what you're doing with um, the upside and, and all that stuff. And, but maybe we can go back a little bit about, you know, where you grew up and your background with entrepreneurs and the space. Cause you work with a lot of women entrepreneurs, right? Mostly in that space. Coincidentally. Yes, it is mostly women. But it wasn't designed that way initially. You know, I think that's where the need was at the time when I started this three years ago, I think that group had the biggest pain points and therefore became automatically the biggest group of clients and then it just grew from there. Right, but if I, and I know I'm getting a little out of order here, but like if I wanted to interact and become part of the upside, could I do that as a man business? Of course. Owner? Okay, good. All right, good to know. Okay, so let's go no back. One ever no one ever has. No, <laughs> I could be the first. No, you could be the first, but we don't have a policy and we're really open to all. It's, it's um, It just happens to be all women. Okay, it's like the chamber women's events. Like I can go, but it's it's designed for women business owners. You would be quite outnumbered, but you are more than <laughs> welcome to join us anytime. Okay, good. So let's uh, talk a little bit about your background. Tell me where you're from. Uh, I know now, I guess through marriage, you're related to a very good friend of mine's family. Um, and yeah, uh, well, yeah, let's get into it. Sure, sure. Well, I'll take you back long, long time ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I grew up in South Carolina, funny enough, but I, oh. I left. I, I, oh, you didn't know that about no, me? No, I don't think you told me that when we spoke with Oh, him. okay. Well, well, that is a little, a little nugget of information that most people up here do not know about me. Okay. And I left when I was around 16 because I went to a New England boarding school. And then, um, you know, college, year abroad, ended up in New York City like a lot of us up here right. sure. did. Uh, big, big lights, big city. And I, I built a whole career in private equity, real estate investments, really all under the alternative investment umbrella. Loved my career, loved the work, loved the people I worked for. But when I was around 30, I had just gotten married and I was pregnant with my first son. And at our 20 week scan, we found out that he was going to require heart surgery. Oof. And it was very devastating, but also putting things into perspective, we were just happy we were going to be able to still have the baby. Right. But this was why you were 20 weeks into being pregnant? 20 weeks in. Wow. And my first, my first one. Ugh. So here I am working this you know, demanding but wonderful full-time job, right. and I find out I am having a baby that's going to require heart surgery. It ended up being two heart surgeries in the end, and he is wonderfully healthy and Good. vibrant eight-year-old today, Good. but it, it, it was a, a little bit of a, a bumpy road getting touch there and, and, there. Yeah. and touch and go. And I just knew, I was, I was like, you know, even in, in the best of circumstances, having a baby and trying to maintain a career is difficult. And yeah, well, in the best circumstances, right. <laughs> it's best and it's hard being a new parent. You're frightened, but of course. then you get something and like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, it just was a, it was a it was a whole different level. So, um, long story short, I launched my own consultancy practice so that I could get that flexibility I needed, so I could work when, where, how I wanted, and take care of my son's health, and maintain the career that I worked so hard to build and right. that I love so much. Right. I did that for seven years. I consulted out on my own, loved it. I made great money. Got to work when I wanted, where I wanted, how I wanted. I had wonderful clients. It was something that came very naturally to me, I guess, because I just had that entrepreneur in me to begin with. And yeah, you also have that personality that like gives people I confidence do. and, you know, it's not like, oh, I don't want to work with this person. I think you give people, you know, confidence. Well, I also had made a name for myself in that industry. I was consistently in that industry and I I carved out a niche in that industry even before I went out on my own. Okay. I already had, I, I, I specialized in marketing and capital raising. That was, I wasn't on the investment side or the accounting okay. side. I was very much my own universe always. Right. And it's a function that all hedge funds, private equity firms, they all need it, but they don't always have enough under management to justify a full-time person. So that oftentimes was me. Right. So I had a great, a great run. 
I actually didn't know anybody else who was consulting at that time. Back, you know, a decade ago, it wasn't as popular as it is today. And then seven years later, it was 2017. It was right after the, the, the latest election. And right. I just was very motivated to solve one big problem, which was I saw so many of my female friends who are now, you know, new moms, everyone has young kids and they were dropping like flies right. out of the work, out of the workforce. And right. I was like, no, wait, wait, you just spent 20 years right. building this career. I know you love your work. And they said, well, I just feel so stuck. It's like, I have to yeah. decide between working full time or not working at all. And I said, no, 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 you can consult like right. I did. Well, you and think that's said, a societal pressure? Like, <laughs> The pressures from work to say, hey, you can't, you know, you got to give us your all and you can't be a stay at home mom. And it's not pressure. It's just it's just fact. So they would say to their employers, um, I'd like to work one or two days from home. Right. So, you know, to avoid that commute or to. Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. So they were going to their employers trying to do it. And the employers are like, no, no, no. The employers all said no. Right. Or they said, sure, you can work one day from home. You're going to take a pay cut. And they're like, but I'm still working. Right. And they're Maybe like, working just, more. I think we work more from <laughs> probably home. Probably right? working yeah. more. Exactly. With kids on our hip. Exactly. And the frustration that came out of that was just so intense that a lot of them said, this is, this doesn't, this just isn't worth it. Anymore. Right. Now, I, just, look, I know, I, t- I know people that were attorneys, they were working up the partner level. They had kids and then the partners are like, Oh yeah, well, we want you to work twenty five hundred hours, you know, build that much, and you got to bring in business. And they're like, "Well, this isn't worth it. I can be home." And I think it's interesting that you made that shift because of a life change, because something that was going on in your personal life, and you pivoted and said, "I love this. I want to keep doing it. How can I do it?" Because obviously, the choice was if you couldn't do it, you were going home. So, because it was your child, right? So you figured it out. I, I figured it out. Life does that um, sometimes, you know. And 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 so I started a company to help other people achieve that same flexibility, that same control. It it's not about starting a new business altogether. It's about right. leveraging the skills you already have and 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 the networks you already have to package those into your own consultancy. So you're you're still doing the same it's work. It's a pivot. It's a pivot, it's, right? It's just the structural, it's just a structural difference. I always say it's the perfect bridge between entrepreneurship and employee being an employee because you're not really an entrepreneur necessarily. You're not taking on a ton of risk. You're not starting anything right. or like inventing employees anything. Employees and a payroll new. and office space and everything. Yeah. Right. You don't have to take over yeah. take on all that overhead. That's but at the same thing. time, you have the control of your your life, your schedule. Um, I always tell people people will say to me, Oh, but it's so unstable and isn't a full like I just have to do full time. It's just more stable. And to me, the most stable right. choice well, I could possibly that's make the is world in, you and I work in, yeah, exactly. <laughs> investing in myself. Right. And then there's a pandemic and then you get fired and then you're like, oh, maybe it's not so stable. Not only that, a lot of, you know, it, no full-time job is stable. I don't care how, you know, you, you may think it all is, dispensable. but unfortunate, all dispensable. And you yeah. really are just a number, unfortunately. And there's nothing wrong with that. But for people who want flexibility and they want to control where they work, when they work, they want to control their schedule. And I think that's a lot of people. You can still do the work you love. It's just the setup is more of a consultancy. And then you just have to learn how to bring in your own business, which is a really important skill, but it's what the upside is all about. It's what we teach our members how to do. It's all about building a strong referral network, understanding how to communicate your value, which a lot of people don't understand. Because for example, Mitch, you could tell people, oh, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. Right. Well, there, that's, that's a commodity. Enough. Yeah. That's a course. commodity. There's a lot of lawyers. Of but course. That's just what you do or who you are. But what, training, what, yeah. what's the value you bring? Right. You're going to save, you're going to solve headaches for people. You're going to take work off their desk that they don't feel like doing you're going to solve problems and you're going to probably save people a lot of money from potential mistakes that they're going to make. That's the real, that's really what you do. Of course. And so teaching, teaching our members, teaching other people how to communicate their value in a way that speaks to results and ROI. That is all about that. That's what it's mostly about. So when you were doing your own consulting, what kind of things were you consulting on projects? I did exactly the same work I did full time, <laughs> but 
as a just consultant. You weren't on the payroll. I just wasn't on the payroll and I was taking on multiple clients, clients instead of right. working for one person. It was absolutely fantastic. I got to choose who I worked with. If I didn't like somebody, you know, sometimes I would start doing just like a one month engagement to see if I really wanted to get in bed with these people. Right. And there were times where I was like, oh, definitely not. Like, I will not be renewing that contract. I don't like the way that person works. And you don't have that luxury when you're working full time. If you yeah, don't like your not. boss you or your supervisor, <laughs> you're, 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 you're taking that baggage home every day. Of course. I was able to choose projects that lit me up and that, in, that were aligned with my values. I still keep up. It's been 10 years since I did that. I still keep in touch with all of those clients. They're, you know, they're, but you don't do any consultancy work anymore. Never. No, nope, all the upside. I no, all the upside. Any consulting work I do is one-on-one -on -one with professionals who are want to learn directly from me how to do it the right way. Well, that's like coaching and motivation, exactly. right? It's not, it's not getting mm -hmm. involved in private equity or capital. Nope, you were getting involved in all that stuff, raising capital, growing companies, all that stuff. Raising capital, um, creating the materials, telling the story, taking very dry, boring data, turning it into a, you know, a story, uh, something right. compelling, um, investor relations work. I, I, I created dozens of annual reports. I, it, it really spanned. A lot of them public companies? No, they were all private. Oh, so you're dealing with their private investors. Okay. Yeah, never a public company, always private investors. Okay. Always, mostly institutional style. Right. And I absolutely loved my work and I loved the people I worked for. So it just, the structure of how I, how I went about my services was different. It was my business. I had my own LLC. I treated myself as a business, not a freelancer. And I used it as a tool to choose who I wanted to work with and how many hours I wanted to work. So when I was pregnant with my second son, I could Make barely get off the couch. Yeah. I could barely get off the couch. <laughs> so I was, I was like, I was like, I think I might work. Uh, I don't know. I might work 15 hours this week. And that was okay because I was getting paid really well for my time. And at that time, because I had little kids, all I cared about was getting paid really well for my time. My time was the most important aspect of my world at that moment. And, and so that was my priority. All right. So I could ask you all kinds of questions about the upside, but why don't you take me through it as to the community you built and what you do for people and how you help them. I don't know if you just help them start a business or raise money. I have no idea. So tell, I've seen the website, and I, but I, I haven't been involved, so I don't know. So teach me about the upside okay. and what it does. Well, do you have five hours? I'm just kidding. No, I, I, I'll, I'll keep don't. it short. I know that. I'll keep, <laughs> I'll keep it short, Mitch. So, well, so we originally started, like I said, back in 2017, and we started with the idea that we were going to do all the work that people didn't want to do. So what, what do consultants not want to do? They don't okay. want to bring in business. They hate business okay, but development. but that's kind of hard to avoid, it sounds, I would think. Well, I was like, I'm really good at business development. Okay, so, so find I'm business, good at, right? Right, yeah. so I'm going to find all the clients. I'm going to match. I'm very good at matchmaking, okay. um, headhunting. So I was like, I'm going to match everybody with clients. Connect and, people. And connect network people, them. and then I'll get, okay. I'll get a piece of the business. Okay. So this is what I learned 12 months into doing that. You give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Right. You teach a man to fish, he'll eat for the rest of his life. Right. What I learned was, so so a client would say, and you right, don't have awesome, to keep giving him fish every day. Right. <laughs> so send me send me the person's bio, and then I'd look, I'd look at their bio, and I'm like, oh wow, they don't know how to write a bio. <laughs> they sound like an employee. Yeah. So I'd have to I would rewrite the bios and then send it, and then the the client would say, great, like, let me get, let's get on a phone call with this person. I want to ask them questions. Sure. And I realized they don't know how to pitch their business. They're interviewing as if this was a job. They're right. not, they're not treating themselves. So I was like, okay, now I have to train people ahead of time on how to pitch their business. And then I, after 12 months of doing that, I, I took a step back. I took two weeks off from the business and I redesigned the business so that I could scale all that knowledge, help everyone level up and get their own clients much easier than they did before they ever met me. So we launched, we relaunched as a community model. Okay. So we, met, we have members, members pay a fee to be. Well, how was it outside. before you were just 
it was just like a I was coaching taking model? A piece. Or no, I was getting a cut of the business. So if I got somebody, I a client and the, and the gig was, you know, $150,000, you know, I might've made 30, $40,000 from that. Got it. Okay. But there wasn't any, you couldn't join a community. There wasn't any. No, there was, and they weren't being connected to each other. So sometimes I, I, I mean, I met hundreds of people. Right. There wasn't a forum and to interact or whatever. No. And I was like, oh, I should really connect you to this person because you are, are in the same industry. I bet you know a lot of the same people. And I'm like, what am I doing? So I redesigned the business as a community model. So right. we have members and the members pay a fee to be in the upside. And with that, they get an expanded network of quality connections. Right. They also get a co collaborative environment that supports and advances their business. And they get tools and resources that level up their business. This is, this is what all, all three of those are absolutely necessary for being successful as a consultant. And that right. doesn't mean scaling. A lot of our members don't even want to scale. No, they're they're right. like, that's the reason. Right. They're like, right. they're like, yeah, they're like, I just want to make, you know, $300,000 a year making, right. you know, Have working when, where, life and right. when and where I want, working with whoever I want. And that's my goal. And that's fine. And that's, that's what most of our members are looking to do. Some members truly are scaling. And they have other okay. products and services. They right. have online online courses and they have all sorts of other things going on. And some of them have their own communities, by the way. Okay. But, but mostly the idea is expanded network, collaboration, and leveling up. There, is so, there are so many best practices that I know because, number one, I consulted for so long and I have oversight on the whole market at this point that it, it it would be just a shame not to share it with as many people as possible because the programs, the well, systems that- a lot of that, people would do that though. That's a passion the, that you have. The systems that I use, they yeah. work. Everyone, I've never had someone in the upside come back and say, I tried that, that strategy and I, it just didn't work. Never has that happened. That's Most good. of our members, they go into the upside not totally knowing what to expect. And within just months, most of them have either doubled or tripled their rates. They've, they've gotten more consistent clients. They've gotten more long-term clients with longer terms, with better terms. They've, they've completely leveled up their game. And even if they have no intention of scaling, because a lot of, you see a lot of talk about grow your business, grow your business, grow your, a lot of people, they don't want to grow their business. They just want to get better clients that right, pay more. Right. Yeah. You don't need to have more work. You just have better no. work for a higher fee. Correct. So it's funny. I, I get a lot of people that come to the upside. They're like, I just want more. I want more clients. I go, then you're in the wrong place because <laughs> we're not all about getting more clients. I'd rather have one client. I'd rather have two clients at 400 grand for the year than 10 you know, clients. A, right. Then 10 clients. Yeah, at, you know, for, it, it's, it's a no brainer. It's, right. it's a no brainer. So it's interesting how you, so you started out with this idea. I, I don't know if you had a business plan or you had a marketing plan or whatever you started with. Of course with. I did, Mitch. <laughs> and, but you spent a year kind of figuring it out, you know, kind of saying, is this working? And then you came to the conclusion that I guess long-term the way you had it wasn't working for you. Like you wanted it to be more of a community and right. I mean, it wasn't where it, and, and to be honest, I didn't go out in that 12 months trying to figure it out. I had it figured out. I just didn't like that business model because okay. what I learned was it didn't, it didn't solve the mission that I was out to solve. So right. it wasn't I helping out, the people like the way you wanted to help helping them. The, exactly. It wasn't really helping them long-term. It was a band-aid for people. And I realized they need to learn how to do this the right way. Because as you know, you're an attorney. If you can't bring in your own business, you are not a, you, you do not have a business. Oh, no question about it. That's why most you attorneys are struggling in the country. They have no business skills. They can't develop any They have kind no of business. business development yeah. skills. A lot so, of my friends are going to hate me for saying that, but you know. But that can truth. be learned. That can be yes, learned. That's different absolutely. than sales. That's right. different than sales. Right. Business development. And I was talking to somebody yesterday. I think it was a podcast. Business development is definitely different than sales. Definitely different. Extremely and different. And here's the thing. I'm not special. I was always good at business development but I'm not special. I'm not a salesperson. In fact, if you, anyone out there who knows me knows that 
I am an extreme introvert, but I learned how to do That's business development. Well, it's true. And, and listen, I'm hiding behind a screen right now. Well, you can not, see me. I, but... You know, I can, I can see you and that's about it. So who knows who's listening right Yeah, now. but business but development, though, is about building relationships and about it's people about building relationships. in you. And so how, how it's do about, you be an introvert? It's about, spe- because I'm confident. You can still be an introvert. And yeah, be confident. confident. That's true. And I'm, I'm confident in my skills. I know I'm, I always knew I was really, really good at what I did. And I knew that I could help my clients move the needle. And I knew how to speak about my, that's different than sales. So just, I knew how to speak about myself in a way that communicated my highest possible value. Right. And, and that is why I always had, I had clients come to, I had to turn clients down. I literally was turning clients down because I didn't have the bandwidth to take on more work. Of course. That's That's the the position you want to be in, right? That's That's exactly And people get mad at me. Yeah, they, were, like, they were like, well, well do, you have, do you have somebody else you can send me to? I was, and at the time, you know, Facebook wasn't around. It was, right. back, you know, before all the social networks. And I really didn't ha- know anyone who did what I, what I did. And I said, I'm so right. sorry. Now, now let me ask you the hard question. Mad at me. Let me ask you sure. the hard question. So let's reflect a little bit. Because now you're teaching people and helping people to be that confident person, to network, to develop relationships, develop business. But- did was it did it come naturally to you did you have mentors how did you get to that level of did you just like well i'm lucky and i'm i i was just born that way and i have that personality i mean what what's your thoughts about it reflecting on looking back on you um i just i just you know what part of my special sauce and what i think is my special sauce is i'm just always myself and i know yeah. what i'm good at i know what i'm not good at i am not someone who can work a big room Um, I don't even try. It's just not, it's not, and it's not even a skill I want to learn. I'm not good in those situations. I get anxiety, honest to God, like you'll see me hiding in a bathroom half the time (laughs) at these things. I don't like it and I'm not good at it. So, and I don't want to be good at it. It's not, I don't think that you have to network in that way. So I, out of just, out of just knowing who I am and, and being authentic with who I am, I learned how to network and build relationships using, using what comes naturally to me what and makes using you what feels comfortable yeah. to me. And what I, feels comfortable to me yeah. is intimate one-on-one connections. Yeah, I was talking and, to somebody last week, and I, I think that that's true. A lot of people in sales, let's put sales aside for the moment, right? or business development, whoever they're working for, whoever's their um, supervisor, let's say, right? Not their coach, their supervisor, will tell them this is how you got to do it, right? But they're not comfortable with that. And they don't succeed because they don't want to make cold calls or they don't want to, you know, put flyers on everybody's doorstep or whatever it happens to be. And I think your point's a good one because I think you definitely can be successful and build relationships and do the things you need to do, but do it the way what makes you comfortable because that'll right. and- confidence. Absolutely. And let me tell you why it works, because I combine what I'm comfortable with, which is more intimate interactions, one-on-one calls, one-on-one meetings back in the day, um, you know, back in 2019, you know, one-on-one lunches and coffees and just all these intimate. Oh, you could meet people like in person? Like what? Oh, well, yes. Like dinosaurs used to do that. Back in the day, we used to do that. (laughs) Like in the caveman days when you go into the cave and you visit people. Back in the locked in old, back in the 2019 yeah. <laughs> days, but yes, we used to do that with people. But I combined it with one other very, very important tool, very, very important tool, which is okay. that one sentence elevator pitch, the one sentence that describes what I do and who I do it for and what I can do for you. In like ten words or less. In ten, you like got name it. Name that tune. Well, we, I have this networking in group, ten, and we. And they said you can describe yourself if you can do it in ten words or less. You get to go again, or something like that. And it's not even describing yourself; it's describing the value that you provide, or okay. that your business provides. Right. And not what you do, but the value that you provide. It's not I'm Mitch the That's lawyer. An Aaron Halperism. Yes. Well, oh, okay. Well, you heard it here first, but, but I always tell people, I'm like, don't just tell me what you do. Tell me what you can do for me. It actually drives me crazy when people tell me what they do because I know what they do. I want to know why they're different and what makes them special. And don't tell me bad things about your competitors. Well, we do this. They don't, I don't want to hear about that. 
I want to hear oh, about God, what no. do you do for people and why? Yeah, that's a good point. So the combination of having that one-on-one, -on -one, if I have, let's say I had six one-on-one -on -one interactions in a day, if, right. let's say, you know, I lined up five or six calls in a day over the course of, you know, several months, that turns out to be a lot of people hearing that one powerful sentence and they all remember. Right. They all remember and I'm making and a list of Aaron Halperism. So I got one okay. second elevator, one sentence elevator pitch. You'll hear me talk about that ad nauseum because <laughs> I think it's so, it is one of the most important tools is refining your offer, refining and refining your offer. A lot of right. consultants get out there and say, you know, I'm just going to like talk to my network, see where the need is. And, and I'm like, no, you, you vomit know, I, on people. That's what happens. Yeah. Well, it's also, um, they the won't remember was. you. They won't yeah. remember what you do. They, they'll be confused. They won't know how to open new doors for you. So when you're very, very specific, in fact, I worked one-on-one -on -one with someone, this is a perfect example. I worked one-on-one -on -one with someone yesterday for, okay. a, for a coaching session. And of course, like many people with 15, 20 years experience, she could do a million different right. She's things. She's all over the place. Because she, when you she work knows a for lot of 20, stuff. Right, yeah, of when you work for 20 years, you yeah. know a lot of stuff. So of course this is, I'm summarizing a one hour session, right. but <laughs> at the end of the day, we summarize that she was, she was, she, she helps teen, teen, teen retailers and brand, teen retailers and brands capitalize on cultural trends. Okay. To inject immediate seven and eight figure revenue growth. That's it. That's so, a good hour to get to that. Well, <laughs> when you have 20 years experience, do you, yeah. do you know how powerful that sentence is? Of course, you boiled it down. That sentence will triple her rate. Right. Because before she was like, I'm a marketing and branding. Right. Nobody can blah, put blah, you blah, in blah. a box. They can't put you on the shelf and say, oh, that fills that. Oh, yeah, I understand. But now we know that she specializes in teen retail, which is very specific in a right. very good way. Right. And we know, and we know that she's going to grow my business. We know she's not for like diddly squat startups because she already said seven, eight figure growth. So I know right. that she's expensive. I know that she's meant for a, at least an eight figure business, probably much bigger. Um, you know, where every word counts, every word was on purpose. And we talked about, and, and again, we injected that, you know, capitalizing on cultural trends because when you're working with teen businesses, yeah. The idea is that you need someone who knows exactly what's going on, has their the pulse on that teen, teen cultural shifts, because I can tell you I certainly don't. And <laughs> and it's hard but at the executive level. We're all old. We're not teenagers. But right. this girl, she was very specialized in that, knew exactly what was going on. And and she has the chops to prove it and the numbers to prove it. So it just worked beautifully, but believe it or not, that's, that is that tool in combination with one-on-one -on -one interactions absolutely will build your business. And I just know because that's the only way I could build my business. I, I just couldn't do it any other way. I'm, I'm not someone who's going to work a room at a networking event. Right. Well, you know, that's, that's a skill too, but networking events a lot about quick meets, get someone's business card, learn briefly what to do and then follow up with them. That's, you know. That was, that. talk about dinosaur age. That's, yeah. that is the dinosaur. You will not see that happening. For a long probably, time. Probably, right. I hope never again. And I'll tell you why. It, this, this is, it, it rewards people who are pushy. It rewards people who are super outgoing. Right. And who have nothing better to do than follow up. Right. I'm too busy to follow up with all these people. Like I, if I have a staff, I remember back in, in, I think it was 2000. I remember like scanning my boss's business cards in like a scanner. Oh, right. Card scan. That's crazy. Yeah, card scan. After he'd come back from the conference, I'd have this stack of cards right. and then I'd have to like edit it because it didn't get some of the names right. And, and I remember thinking, God, is this like really what I'm going to be doing? Like, this is how we do right, things. This is your life. It's just like a bunch of random cold leads. And to me, I'd rather have 10 conversations and generate relationships and really get to know people on a genuine, authentic level. Ask them about what they do. What connections would be helpful to you right now? How can I help you? How can I be right. helpful to you? Rather than just 
email a hundred people that I met for all of 10 seconds. It right. just doesn't, to me, that doesn't make sense for, for building real relationships. So how do you teach your people how to network and build those relationships? I, I teach them how to leverage their own relationships and we break them into three tiers. The top tier is going to be former bosses, supervisors, um, bosses, bosses, and the second tier is any kind of former colleague, even if it was the EA of your boss, that's still a colleague. Like everybody's a colleague. Right. Your old intern, by the way, Mitch, when you were, you know, 28, right. that person is now a director level Probably, employee, yeah. right. you know, like you forget how old, like how, what, you know, you were only probably five years apart at the time, but it seemed ancient. Right. But, but those people are now VP director level employees. All those people are tier two. And then tier three is friends of friends, um, alumni, co you know, college and high school alumni. I mean, I've reached out to people 10 years older than I am who went to the same university. And I just said, hey, I'm also a GW alum and I'd love to get together for coffee. And, you know, I have a whole script that I use. Yeah. And so I, I, I give people in the upside that script because it worked for me. I give people the email subject line that opened 90% of the emails I sent out with that subject line, the door opened. You know, yeah. I know what works and what doesn't. Is that an Aaron Halperism? I know what works and what doesn't. No, I, the, uh, the subject <laughs> line, the subject right, line of little, your magic that's email. A little, that might be a little, a little, a little too confident. Um, well, I'm not going to give that subject line away. Because no, don't give members, it away. My, but members, it my members pay for it. But, yeah. but it is an Aaron Halperism. It is an Aaron Halperism, and it's only because, again, I'm not special. I'm not a business development expert, and I don't go around saying I am. You know what I am an expert in? Consulting and building a consulting, a consulting practice that generates consistent premium clients. And there's a lot that goes into it. It's not, it's not just how to market yourself the way right. people think it is, think you should market yourself. It's about what sentence comes out of your mouth when people ask, what do you do? Yeah. Who in your network are you reaching out to? What are you telling them that you do for a living? Are you talking about yourself the whole time or are you asking them questions? It, it, there's, a, there's a formula for how to do it the right way right. the first time. Because once you've already opened those doors within your network, and if you haven't done it the right way, it's really hard to go back. And I'll give you an example. So many people still think that I match consultants and clients. Because back when I first started opening all those doors, that's what I was telling people I was doing. And I can't, it's been three years and people still are like, oh, you know, do you need like, oh, I have, I know someone at Pfizer who does x -rays. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, we're not really doing that anymore. You know, we don't, we don't do that. They're like, oh, really? Or, <laughs> you know, or they'll say, oh, you help moms return to work. I was like, yeah, no, that's not really, that's like not really the story. But because I didn't have my story really refined in the beginning and I was using my network, I was using up all those doors. Right. They, a lot of them still think that's what I do. Right. And I don't want other people to make that mistake. You know, get it down the first time. You can always adjust, but you really want to spend a lot of time honing in on what that offering is so that when you do open those doors, you don't waste them. So do a lot of your members, I don't know if you know this, do they have... Do they build with your help, like keep in touch programs? I mean, if you have, I don't know, 250 people, everyone knows if they really try hard to go through their lists and their thoughts and their outlook contacts and their emails and their head, do they create some sort of a, you know, cause, cause obviously people you contact, right. Even if they're somebody you're catching up with, they might not have work for you right now, but they might have work for you in six months or a year or whatever. So do your members do something to keep in touch, build a program? It reminds me of a book called Referral of a Lifetime, which is 15, 20 years old or something. And it's just like that. But what you're describing sounds like, you know, okay, don't go to the county chamber of commerce and get all these business cards. You don't know anything about these people. Go to who you know, right? So do they? Go to who you know. Yes. Well, this goes back to that three tier system that I talked about before. Right. You're and, tiering your and, people who you know. And and just so everybody knows, we give away that system. Um, we give it away. It's a free download on our website, so okay. anyone can go and download it. It's be the upside.com. It's on our homepage. You can just okay. download it and get that 
that system yourself because it works. And we'll put a it link works, in the show notes too. It works really, really well. So you know, the key to, what'd you call it? Is that a Mitchism? Keep, 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 no, keep in touch, no, keep in touch program. Keep in touch program. I have not labeled like How do you keep yourself anything. in front of people so they think of you because you did, you talked to them six months ago, something else came up. I don't, I don't know. Well, first and foremost, everyone needs to position themselves as a, as a subject matter expert. So you have chosen, Mitch, you, you're very smart. You've chosen to launch a podcast. So you think I'm so smart, the, but I got you. Uh, you're from from a from an upside standpoint and what we teach you're you're doing you're doing something right which is you're positioning yourself as a subject matter expert you've taken the time to launch a podcast um media something that is very consistent you're consistently putting it out and you're you're amplifying your, your voice and you're getting in front of a lot more people because you are featuring entrepreneurs, you've carved out a space, and now people are connecting not just Mitch Lawyer, but Mitch Lawyer Entrepreneurs. Right. That's and so true. I, and you've done that obviously yeah. on purpose. It's very, yeah. very smart. So we teach our members, it's not just about, everyone keeps in touch. I mean, that's right. a given. You have to keep in touch with people. That's not even something we talk about because to right. me, that's so basic. So it's a given, it's, you should be doing that anyway. It's, it's way too basic. Right. Where I'm talking people about- People don't do it though, Aaron. They don't do uh, it. My people do. Okay. <laughs> my, right. Our members, our members right. well, do Well, now it. they're part of your group. They're doing that. But I'm saying <laughs> yeah. if they're not, yeah. they're not doing it. They're terrible. People are terrible at keeping in touch with other people all the time. Well, oh, Aaron says, oh, you know what, Mitch? I didn't even think about it. I hadn't heard from you in eight months and I sent you that piece of business somewhere else. Well, okay. Well, in the upside... Okay, so they everybody, should, that's everybody, one reason why they should. Yeah, right. Everybody knows you. I mean, that's so basic that it's we don't even hardly talk about it. Right. Because like, it's why wouldn't a, you a do given. that? Right. Why wouldn't you do? That? I know so, that's what I say all the time. Why so, wouldn't you do that? Yeah. Moving on. Um, <laughs> so, positioning yourself as a subject matter expert. So, as a okay, consultant, people are hiring you to be an expert in something. Right. Why else would they be hiring you? you are positioning yourself as an expert on whatever skill it is that you've decided to hone in on. So you've chosen to launch a podcast. A lot of our members put out weekly articles just once a week. Right. Content article, marketing of some sort, right? An, an article about the industry, something about some insights over the industry, trends, um, you know, what's working, what's not working, new, new companies popping up, you know, what people can look for. A reason for people in the industry to stay connected to you and read your content. It's so easy. It's free. If you pump something out once a week, even if right. it's three paragraphs, as long people, as it's yeah. consistent, people will start to see, oh, this is someone who is staying on top of the industry, they're listening to podcasts, they're reading books, they read all the papers, they know exactly what's going on because look at all these articles they put out. And that's just one example. And, and you don't even have to have your own blog. You can publish those articles right on LinkedIn. Right. I mean, talk about like the lowest hanging fruit and LinkedIn loves it when you do that. They reward right. you when you do that. They right. want you to publish on their platform. Especially articles, so, right? Yeah, so you like don't it. even have to have your own blog. You can just publish it right on LinkedIn and then link those directly to your LinkedIn page. It's, it's absolutely genius and it works. Yeah. And that's just one low hanging fruit example. So people do podcasts, people write maybe a weekly article. Maybe some people, we they send out a weekly newsletter they just every week, once a week, something, some sort of insights. Some of our members use Instagram as their platform and they do, um, one of our members does a live show every once a week. It's just a live interview with someone really interesting that has to do with her industry. Right. And she's been growing an audience that way. Right. And people are seeing her and it takes, she says it takes all of 10 minutes to set up and the 10 right. minutes is just creating. Well, you do through cover. Zoom and live stream on the Facebook. It's not so hard. I mean, but she's doing it on Instagram. It's even easier. Instagram oh, TV. Oh yeah, I've, I've and, attended and, a couple of those, right. And yeah. she, she, she's like, I think it takes me 10 minutes just to make the cover art on Canva. Yeah. And other than that, I literally just hit the button and start. She's like, it's the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. And, and so it, it depends on your industry, but just positioning yourself as a subject matter expert with consistent content. After 12 months of doing that, you will see traction and people will remember you. It's really, really important. 
Yeah, you know, I just picked up a spot. I've been picking up a couple of sponsors, like more affiliate relationships, not that they're paying for the podcast, but, you know, I promote what they're doing because it helps my listeners. And then we make a little bit of money to hopefully someday somebody will do the editing for me. I don't know. But we just, are you familiar with royalty.com? I don't um, know. No, there's a lot of those. There's a yeah, lot there's of a lot of them. It's like a CRM, but it's the kind of thing, and it's probably not applicable to a lot of your members, but it's the kind of thing where for people that don't know what to do, they can take their own content or they can take this company's content and you can be very specific to your industry and do just what you said, automatically post to different things, add it to your blog, create a landing page, email newsletters, and you can run your whole CRM. It's not free, but you can run your whole CRM that way with a couple of clicks every day to, yeah, to create yourself as an expert in whatever particular field, health and wellness or travel or I don't know, whatever you do for a living. So you're right. There's yes. a lot of services out there that people can use, but that's, that's not what the upside does, right? I mean, it's not like it's a place where you share ideas and you... Correct. And for example, our members have shared that Hootsuite works really Hootsuite well. Hootsuite is right, them. is a good one. There's so one. so that's Buffer so, is so also that's, like Hootsuite. Yeah. So, you know, we talk a lot about HubSpot and Hootsuite. Right. So we also, you know, we have a lot of monthly programming and the programming is designed on purpose to sh to not to knowledge share. And we talk about what technology everyone's discovering and yeah. using because it changes all the I time. I know, I two, get some of my best ideas. Two years way. ago, two yeah. years ago, it's so funny because it's so common now, but two years ago, we were having a discussion about what technology is everyone using right now? What's working? Like what's really hot right now? And a few people are like, you should really check out Canva. And then there's this thing called Zoom. You should really look at it that. Was that so it was we, around two years ago, Zoom? It was around two, three years ago. You're kidding. I just heard about it like as this pandemic started. Oh, we've been using it in the upside. Our members, we have a separate account just for our members to use. We pay for a, prof a pro level account yeah. for our members to access. And we've been doing that for years, but we were ahead of the, ahead of the curve yeah. big time. Right. And same with Canva, you know, Canva was brand new a couple of years ago and now, oh my gosh, I mean, I can't live without this service. Oh yeah. I listened now, to a podcast um, um, for how I built that guy, Roz, great podcast, mm -hmm. by the way. And he interviewed the woman who started Canva. She sold it for a ridiculous amount of money. And that's how I started it's, doing the artwork for the podcast and different things for Pinterest. Yeah. And you know, it's funny. It's very, very valuable, especially for solopreneurs. And especially for people who aren't, well, only for people who aren't designers. I mean, I have right. Adobe Suite. I never even use, sorry, Adobe. I never even use it anymore because Canva really Makes accomplishes it easy. Yeah. everything I need to do. And it's not a graphic much, designer. Much. Well, I am. I, I no, do but I mean, have you don't those want skills, it to be your career. But, but I don't want to spend three hours doing <laughs> right. something when I can just do it in Canva. It's not necessary. Canva is right. a shortcut for sure. Yeah. But it works. It gets the job done and it's amazing. It's easy. It's quick. It, yep. It's perfect. That's true. That's true. I mean, There's these are all, this is but all But they're the always coming up. There's new stuff. I mean, MailChimp did a couple of years ago. I used that. Now I'm switching over to this. There's other CRMs. You want to see what people are using it and how they're using it and you know, it's good for how a they're form. using it. It's yeah. very good for a form. So, so that's just a tiny piece of the the knowledge sharing. But we just got off and we call them industry circles. We just got an, off an industry circle yesterday where we were talking about and sharing ideas about trends going on in that particular industry. It happened to have been a retail. Um, it was a retail e-commerce fashion beauty circle. Okay. And just talking about where's the uptick, what who you know our customers buying right now and why and the information that we shared on that call you know again it you know people are going to be listening to this podcast much later than today it's right. it's june of 2020 so we are talking about how consumers are buying beauty and skincare e-commerce is exploding because of this whole mentality and it is an american mentality by the way but this whole mentality of i deserve it right I deserve it. Yeah. Purchases under a hundred dollars that make people feel good. Right. And so, so with that knowledge, our members are for the next month are going to be approaching clients, approaching businesses and saying, I want to help you tap into this trend, staying on top of trends, taking an hour out of the month to share those trends with other people in your industry who are also consultants. And so all of you can go out to your own networks and say, say, you know, you know, pivot how you're pitching your, your services so to capitalize on the trends that are going on right now. 
it's very powerful and it's very valuable. Okay, so how do people participate in your community in the upside? Is it how a they, place I mean, they can't go to anywhere right now, but is it online? Is it on Facebook? And it never was, Mitch. No, it's it always never been was. It was always virtual because okay. we have members all across the country. We have some members in the UK. Um, we had a member in Portugal. You it, never had we, like a three day summit boot camp? I did. We did actually. No, we did oh, no. have an okay. in person. It was fantastic. That was almost two years ago, but we did have an in person. It was absolutely incredible. We hope to do it again, not anytime soon, obviously, right. but we definitely plan to do it again. And like everything I do in a more intimate way, it's not going to be 200 people. It's going to be probably 20 people. Right. And who are, you know, and that'll be, that'll be the space we have, but it was always virtual. It was designed to be virtual because it's not necessary to be, we, we all work virtually anyway. Right. Every one of us works remotely. Yeah. So, so there is that how it fits, any right? Reason, yeah. yeah. It all fits into the same culture. And I laugh because there's so much, you know, when COVID first broke out in March and April, just article after article, all about working remotely and being productive. I'm like, okay, but that's your been, world. We've been doing this yeah. for years. Like this right. is, this is not new for us at all. And then people are like talking about zoom background. Yeah. You could have like, given zoom seminars probably. Right. Well, if you look at my Instagram, which is yeah. the same, it's be the upside is the Instagram handle you'll see a Zoom tutorial from a year ago right. where where I talk about, oh, here's this cool feature that a lot of people don't That's know to help your well, people. It's to help my yeah. people and to help people who follow the upside because they enjoy, again, subject matter expert. They enjoy the tips I give out. I give out a lot of free information as much as I possibly can because um, I just want, I, I want as many people as possible who want to work for themselves and be their own boss. I want them to have the tools and the confidence to be able to do that. So if you either are a consultant or you're thinking of branching out on your own or whatever, they would go to your website. Is that how they get started? Be the upside.com. Be the upside.com. Yep. The upside.com was taken. And <laughs> so we are, we are be the upside. Yeah. We are be the upside.com. And, and, and it starts there. I mean, our membership is quarterly, so it opens and closes at the end of every quarter. Um, right. You it, can't it just, just sign up, right? You told you me that. You can sign up, you can sign up and be on a wait list, but, okay. but we don't let, we, you can only join at the, you know, on each January quarter. 1st. It, yeah. Mar yeah. It's on the beginning of the beginning of each quarter, April 1st, you know, July 1st and so forth. So it's always, it's always quarterly, but it's, it's, it's a membership. It, most of our members stay in indefinitely. It's not, it's not like a cohort where it's, it's not a program where it starts and begins at a certain quarter, but right, right. It, the most exciting product that we're putting out and we've never done it before, but it's been a long time coming. Um, and it will be out in 2020 is a course. An it is online a course. It's an online course, which makes perfect sense for what I teach and what we do. And it's, how to launch a consistent consultancy that attracts premium clients and gives you the freedom to work when, where, and how you want. Now, is this that, for members is only the, or is it going to be- No, it's not. Roll it's in? actually, okay. I would say it's a prequel to the upside. So for people who- oh, makes who, sense. Who they, they know they want to leave their corporate job, or maybe they're even three months out they're consulting, right. they're spinning their wheels a little bit. They're like, I've had some wins. I know I'm under, I get this a lot. I know I'm undercharging. People say that to me a lot. The lawyers say and, that to me all the time. <laughs> oh, really? I don't oh, feel my like God. my lawyers, my lawyers don't undercharge. No, no. The clients never think you're undercharging. <laughs> no. The lawyers are saying, well, I charge no. you like 50 an hour and everybody else goes 250 an hour because I don't charge. Oh, I want that. I want that lawyer. Yeah, my, right. My lawyer it's ridiculous. You can't make money. You can't pay your bills on 250. Yeah, it's crazy. No. So. No, and lawyers, look, I can go into this whole rabbit hole, but you, all of you are so conditioned to, to your hourly rates. Um, a lot of what I teach too is how to get out of the hourly rate. Right. The hourly rate, work, that's how I used to bill, by the way. And it yeah. works great for certain people. It really does. There's nothing oh, but you wrong only have a certain amount of hours, right? You can only- But you only have a certain amount of hours. And, and a lot of our members, their work directly correlates to business growth. So if if- a perfect example is the person we just talked about before who focuses on that, the teen market. And she comes up with different product lines and programs that generate really high revenue numbers. 
why in the world would she pay, get paid an hourly rate for 15 years of experience right. leading up to that point where you, you're penalized for being efficient right. if you charge an hourly yeah. rate. It's the, con- it's the whatever, it's a conflict of, total conflict of interest. A total conflict. And, and, and then she's helping companies make seven and eight figure revenue streams off of her product lines that she develops. She, that's worth a lot more than whatever that $200,000 hourly rate, whatever it's going to end up being. You know, I said to her, if you make $10 million for a company, what do you, th- if, if the estimated value is about 10 million, what do you think you should be charging? And she's like, flat I have fee no wise, idea. you mean? Yeah as, a, yeah. as a flat fee. She's like, I have no idea. I was like, well, an agency would probably charge around 750 to a million for a project like that. She's like, really? I was like, well, yeah, that's 10% of the value. That's nothing. Right. And then, and then, you know, she started thinking about it and I was like, let's just put it at 450. Let's just put it at 450 for a nine well, month she's got lower overhead. She's got a lot lower overhead, right. but she's still in a situation like that. She'd probably still have to sub out some people under her, but they would be paid very Low much average. less right. than, than what, than what she's making. So the point is thinking about, value pricing, the value of what you're providing versus your time. Right. That's another thing we do talk about in the upside a lot. And that's a skill, that's a much higher level skill, but, but it's definitely something everybody can learn. Oh, for sure. I mean, most of my work I try to do on a flat fee basis. First of all, I hate billing hourly. It causes conflicts with the client. I don't want to keep track of it. And like you said, if I do a, a wills package or a state plan and it's thirty five hundred dollars, it might you know the hourly might not be equivalent. It has to do with my expertise and my knowledge and the fact that I've been doing this since whatever nineteen ninety two or something. I don't know. Yeah, and the fact that, that you're counts. not going to make a mistake. Yeah, that counts. You know, it counts. It counts, and and I hate you know even going back to being back when I was a W two employee. I was so efficient at my work. I could just get stuff done so fast because I was really focused and really good at what I did and, and, and very niche in what I did. And I always felt like, I was like, God, I should really just take longer to do this stuff because I'm actually punished right. by getting it done fast. What do you mean I'm you actually, have no work to do? You know? Right. What do you mean <laughs> you have no work to do? So I'm actually, I'm actually, I'm penalized. You're penalized in, as a full-time employee right, for being efficient. Right. And I know it's it, and, and I will not call his name out because he would kill me. But there was someone I met, I was friendly with back in my 20s. So I was probably 24 or so. Okay. He was probably at the time 29, 30, which seemed ancient at the time. He seemed like a senior level person. <laughs> right. But I remember he said and he just kept getting promoted and promoted. And I didn't think he was like particularly that smart. I was like, how are you getting so many big promotions? He's like, here's the trick, Aaron. 80% of the time you do nothing. And what? 20% of the 20% of the time, yeah, you, know, you just push papers around your desk right. a little bit. And 20% of the time you like really show up and like and like, you know, give it your all. And I said, What? That ain't that doesn't make any sense. He's like, Well, I just got promoted at a Fortune 500 company. And so it makes yeah, sense. You tell like, me what makes sense, right? He's like, you don't, he's like, you will be punished if you put in all your effort all the time, you will, you will not make it. You will be punished. And now I know what he means because it's totally true. That is nuts. But I guess it's now that's not true for, I do want to point this out. That is not true for everyone. Anyone who falls under a more marginalized audience, a thousand percent, you cannot get away with that. That this was a white, a white man, you know, this was 20 years ago. Right. You, you, you can't get away with that if you're a woman, if you're a person of color. Um, Why, because you're more under the microscope, you think? or you, Anybody in that category, which you are not, anybody <laughs> in that category would tell you that you do have to work twice as hard. You have to prove yourself more. You can't make a mistake. I was always the only woman. Anytime we traveled in business, because I've worked in that field of real estate investments and private equity and hedge funds, I was always the only woman when we traveled. And I didn't mind it. I, I loved my colleagues. Um, we had awesome, we still have great relationships. But 
when they went out and got drinks, I never had a drink or I sipped the same one the entire night. And they were like, oh, Aaron, we know you party. We know you go out. Like, why won't you get, why don't you have a drink? Right. And I said to them, I go, because it only will take one time right. for me to slip up. And you, do, you guys will You'll never. You'll post it on Facebook. You well, that was before Facebook. But, <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> but, but seriously, but that's what happens, but you'll right? You'll never let me live it down. Right. You guys just look funny, and you're so cool, and having a good time. If I did what you did, no way. You will. You, I, I yeah. would. My career would would go on a totally different I agree. path because yeah. I'd be that person. Right. And I can't afford to do that. I can't afford that. Right. And they, they acknowledge. They, they. They said, you're right. said, God, you're, you're right. And, and I said, but it's fine. I'm cool. I'm having fun. You know, I, just because I don't have, you know, my shirt off like you do and I'm sweating. <laughs> right. Um, and that is a true story. Shirt <laughs> off, sweating, a um, lot of drinks. You know, I don't have that luxury. Right. Yeah. No, I, that's, I think that's, people, that's people learn that the hard way. Some, yeah. And people <laughs> learn that the hard way sometimes. Well, I learned it watching other people. Yeah. I learned it watching other people and I was like, wow, they're still talking about that time that such and such did Mary that Mary like had one night where she was like a little bit off and they are still they're still talking, still laughing about it. And and we just don't have that that privilege or that luxury. So so um maybe one day we will, but but certainly not now. And that's just a very small example. It it really permeates pretty much everything. Yeah, I'm sure it does. Um, it, it does. And I I'm, think I'm conscious of it, but I'm not uh, obviously not as noticing of it as a male. Now well, I know I'm not how hard it is to be a white male because everyone, everything's blamed. Oh yeah, us. let me let me cr- let me get my violin <laughs> out and, and and play you a sad song. No, but but it's also I'm not complaining about it because I took that into my own hands. I said, you know what? Fine. I'm going to leave the nine to five. I'm going to redefine the nine to five. I'm going to start my own business. And now I have control of how much money I make because I have control of my rates. Right. And if you don't want to pay my rates because you don't want help raising, you know, $2 billion in capital, then you don't have to hire me. But you're saying you want $2 billion in institutional capital. Well, that's not free. Right. And I, I can help you get there, but these are my rates. Right. And if you don't want to pay it, you don't have to. Yeah, that's your choice. You have to decide if you want to raise that capital or not. So it's, I got to have the control back in my hands and it allowed me to do anything I wanted anytime I wanted. And, and it it takes a certain level of confidence, which is, I guess, why what the upside does, right? Because it takes a lot of confidence for me too. I walk away from clients a lot of times because I'm like, listen, this is what I charge. And if you want to go somewhere else, there's other people you can go work with. You got to be able to walk away, but a lot of people don't, oh, they got to, you know, I don't want to lose that or it's my opportunity or whatever. They're not confident well, enough to say no. They're not, a, they're, they may not be confident enough to say no, but, but one thing I teach all upside members, and this is a great piece of advice that whoever is listening to this call should, should or this podcast should really um, absorb and pay attention to is all clients are not created equally. I see a lot of people say, well, isn't it better to have something rather than nothing? Right. And my answer to that is absolutely not. So if you have a client that's taking up, we'll call it 20 hours a week of your time, and you know that they're like, you're, you're way undercharging them. It's not an awesome client. You're not, you love working with them because you're passionate about whatever they do, blah, blah, blah. But ultimately, you're not being paid what you really should be paid, or God forbid, you're working for free, under the <laughs> assumption that you're going to get something out of it later. Which, yeah, by the, the way, worst one, mistake in your life. One hundred percent of the time will not happen. One hundred. I can tell you from my, personal experience too. Never, in my twelve ever, ever. years, in my twelve years of doing this, right? Never once have I seen a pro bono or a charity case or a super, super low rate turn into a great client. Or doesn't happen in the re- legal profession. Or either. lead to a referral. Nope. Never, ever will that happen. And what I tell people is this, that's 20 hours a week that you could be spending having virtual coffees with people or maybe one day in-person coffees again, right. get, building your network. Yeah. You could be pumping out articles positioning yourself as a subject matter, pitching yourself to podcasts, right. elevating your cred, 
You could be spending that time building the back end marketing funnel of your business so that you can generate premium quality clients, but instead you're spending 20 hours a week doing nothing. And then the other excuse I hear is, oh, but it's like, because I'm building my case studies and my portfolios. What? You've been working for 20 years. <laughs> How long are you going to be building this? They're like, yeah, but those were employers. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't matter. It, it, who cares? If it, that's just the structure under which you work. Right. If you were W2, 1099, LLC, it doesn't matter. It's still work that you did. It's still results that you generated. Yeah, Aaron, but, but I did that with a team. We know that. We know, I met somebody once um, in the very beginning stages of my business and she was like, I was part of the team who helped launch Open, Open by American Express. Okay. Now, that's a huge success. Open by American Express was, I remember when that first came out back right. in the day, early 2000s, it was so novel. It was so cutting edge. It was really different, really cool. We had never seen something like that before. And I always thought, oh, whoever came up with that, I hope they got promoted. I hope they, she's like, well, you know, it was a whole team. I'm like, but we know that. No, you, we know it was, it's assumed it was a whole team, but I can assure you that my male colleagues would say, I spearheaded, I, right. I spearheaded the Open by American Express concept back in 2000. Right. We know you alone did not do that. It is assumed. Right. Just like when you, when you read someone's bio and it's written in third person, we know you wrote it, right, but I still want to see it. I still want to see it in third person. Right. Do you know what I mean? There's like yeah, just- No, you don't write that in first person. You'd be surprised. <laughs> That's what surprised. sad to hear. I'm you'd sorry. You'd be surprised. That. It's okay. We, we, we try to teach our people the right way to do things. And that is true. It's- it's, we know you wrote your own bio. We know you did it as part of the team, but having the confidence to own your part. And there's a great story. And, and I should, I, I don't know the names of the people and they're not even relevant to begin okay. with, but, but back in the day when we were putting, you know, the first men on the moon and the press came in and they're like, wow, like Neil Armstrong and, you know, Buzz Aldrin, like the, you know, interviewing all these people. One, one journalist saw a janitor in the corner cleaning up and he went over to the janitor and said, sir, tell me about, you know, what you do. And the janitor said, I helped put two men on the moon. <laughs> yeah. It's all perspective. And that is a true story, by the way. Yeah. That is an absolute true story. And I love that story because it's so aligned with what I try to teach people, which is yeah. owning the fact that they couldn't have done it without you. Companies right. ingrain in you that you are replaceable. Right. They ingrain yeah. that in you in all the corporate culture that we grow up with. Yeah. But ultimately, you helped create that winning product. You helped raise that capital. Do you think I didn't raise $2 billion on my own? Of course not. That's crazy. <laughs> The, the, the PM, the, the owner of that company was a genius at that. He was awesome. He was great. He was so professional. He knew what he was doing, but could he have done it without me and what I did? I don't know. I think my contribution was really, really big. And I think right. he would say the same thing. Does it matter? Ultimately, Not does really. it matter? No, it doesn't <laughs> Not matter. Not really, because here's the other thing, Mitch, is you have control of your own story. Right. That's what I mean. And you yeah. need and you need to own your story. You need to to own your success, own your story because we've been especially women, we've been put down so much in the corporate world that you're replaceable. Um we've been told no so many times. No, you can't work from home one day a week. No, you don't have that promotion. No, we're replacing you with this person. That it all of that over a couple decades will really break down your confidence. So when you launch your own consultancy or your own law practice, whatever it is, having the confidence to, to tell your story and sell your story is something that can make or break your success in that space. Right. Well, maybe someday, I don't know, not in our lifetime, but people will be treated as people and we'll have companies that treat people like they matter because you get rid of all the people. There's no company. It doesn't run on its own, you know? Uh, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. And I know we can go on for hours and hours and hours and you have a busy day. So 
but I do appreciate you coming on the podcast.